because I want to find the thing they suck at and make them good at it. And I want to do it while using specific exercises. So what I want to do when I pick supplemental exercises, I want to pick supplemental exercises that are specific to these big main lifts, the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, and the press. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic, and welcome back to the MED Masterclass. This is episode number six. So you know the drill now. My name is producer Trent, and you're hearing my voice because this was originally recorded for the Barbell Logic coaches. And I have edited the series down into a format that you can enjoy here on this podcast. We've come a long way from Novice LP, and we are now talking about three-week or longer programs and for the first time, we have enough slots in our mesocycle to start to add in supplemental lifts. So that's going to be the focus of today's episode. Matt's going to talk all about supplemental lifts, why you would use them, when to incorporate them, and how to pick from the dozens of variations that are out there. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope you get something out of it. Let's listen in to Masterclass number six. So I want to talk a little bit about supplemental exercises this week. And, and let's start with this. So I want, to, I want to develop a list tonight of supplemental lifts that we would use. But first, let's talk about why. So what is the primary reason that I'm going to use a supplemental lift? So again, not a trick question, big overarching reason. One coach said to exploit a lifter's weaknesses and then strengthen those weak spots. That's right. And so I can actually even pull back even further from, from that point, which is true, to even, even great. Like ultimately, what are we trying to do over the course of like the very first week of somebody's training to say week 70 of somebody's training? What's the overarching goal? Like, yes, make them stronger. But how do we do that? By increasing stress. That's right. So supplemental exercises have to increase stress. That's the point. And there's really four ways that a supplemental exercise can increase stress. Do you guys have some ideas on what that would be? The first one mentioned was range of motion. So one of those options is we can do supplemental exercises that increase range of motion. What else? You can increase intensity. Yep, we can increase intensity or load. Another answer was you could change the tempo of the lift. You could have them slow down or incorporate a pause. We can slow it down. So I'll just, I'll put tempo. The last one's the hardest one to get, but you'll know it when you hear it. Any other like ideas? The coaches came up with several other answers here, and most of them revolved around Increasing time under tension, hypertrophy, introducing more fatigue via a new lift. And we could sum all of those answers up under one category, and that is novelty. So novelty is the fourth option. All right. So in my opinion, when we do supplemental exercises, we're going to pick them for one of four reasons. We're going to pick them to increase the range of motion. When we increase the range of motion, what happens to the intensity? It goes down. When we increase the intensity or load, we are almost always decreasing what? Range of motion. That's right. Range of motion, right? So these two usually are an inverse relationship with each other. Tempo can increase stress. And there's actually two ways of doing that. So we could actually theoretically, we could slow down or do dynamic method, you could argue, is more or less. And the fourth one is novelty, which I would argue may or may not lead to strength improvement. So let's talk about that one for a second. 
any time that we do any new exercise, we we are introducing novelty, right? They're doing an exercise they've never done before. If somebody has a, does a front squat, they've never done a front squat before, they're going to get sore from the front squat. Their body is not adapted to the front squat. But the question is, does that does that process of doing a novel exercise in and of itself lead to strength improvement? One coach said, probably not. Why? His argument was that at first you have to spend time just learning the new movement. So you probably can't do the exercise heavy enough to cause a strength adaptation. Probably what's going on instead is that new motor pattern is taxing the nervous system in a new way, and that's what's creating the fatigue. Yeah, so I would, I would say it's really like said stress, right? So it's how specific, how specific is that stress? I think that's what you're trying to say. Like we know that novelty is stressful. The question is, is it stressful enough and specific enough to drive a strength adaptation? Let me give you an example because probably you're all thinking right now, well, like, I don't know, like if I've never done a box squat or a front squat or a high bar squat or whatever, like that seems like it can make me stronger. But what about like a one-legged Bulgarian split squat? Will that ever make you stronger? The consensus was, yes, it could, as long as you're novice enough or early enough in your development as a lifter for it to be stressful enough to cause a strength adaptation. Now, the question is, for how long? Okay, so let's say now we're past that novice or beginner phase. Now you're someone who's followed this sort of MED principle type lifting, and they are an advanced trainee, certainly a late, intermediate, early advanced. At that point, will a Bulgarian split squat, single leg split squat, make you stronger? Here, most of the coaches said, no, probably not. So it's not really, again, you guys have been in this class now long enough. You know, I don't really ask trick. Like, it's not a trick question. It's not like, I don't think it makes people stronger. I don't have an experience with it making people stronger. Is, I mean, like with any question that you ask, obviously there could potentially be an outlier that could potentially get stronger from a single leg Bulgarian split squat. But we're talking about trying to program for our clients in general. And the question is, would that type of squat make them stronger? Like generally, no. But, well, first off, why? Like, why would it not make them stronger? The answer was not enough load. Yeah, like how much weight can you do on a single leg Bulgarian split squat? How about the guy, let's say you got a guy that can squat 405 for a few reps. How much can that guy single leg Bulgarian split squat? Probably none of us know because we don't take a guy and have him do the thing. Probably half, maybe. I don't know. Right? So the question is, will that make him stronger? And I think generally we're like, yeah, probably not. But is it stressful the first time you do a loaded single leg Bulgarian split squat? Like, is he sore 30 hours later? Yeah. Right? Why? Because of novelty. Because it's novel. So I would argue that there are lots of people that will tell you that novelty is a way to improve strength. And I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a way to improve general strength. Like if I do a new lift, like a single leg Bulgarian split squat, and I do it for two, three, four, five, six weeks in a row, I'll get stronger on that, on that lift but what I'm trying to do with a supplemental exercise is I'm still trying to increase stress to get generally stronger. That's the point. Or maybe I'm trying to get specifically stronger at the, at the main lifts, right? At the, maybe at this point, the person is a, my lifter is a competitive power lifter or strength lifter. So I'm trying to use exercises that would potentially make their normal squat go up or, or, or their competitive squat go up or their bench, or their press, or their deadlift, right? And so I don't think that novelty, I think there is a time where any, anything you do, the first couple weeks of a lift, the stressor is going to be just because it's novel. And just like Daniel said, it's going to be about neurological, like establishing motor patterns there. And the motor pattern for a single leg Bulgarian split squat is not the same thing 
as the motor pattern for a heavy back squat. They're just different. As a matter of fact, it's all different, right? The motor pattern for a box squat is not the same as a normal competitive squat. So one of the things that's important here with novelty is that we choose specific exercises. So on that specificity plane or on that, that spectrum, we want to try to pick exercises that are more specific to the lift we're trying to make better, not less specific. I think I've told this story before on the podcast about taking my daughter's roller skating. It's like the first time I had roller skated since I was in junior high. Any any like middle aged dudes been roller skating in like the last ten years? It makes you real sore. It makes you real sore. Like your your adductors, adductors, the inside of your thigh is insanely sore. Your groin gets insanely sore. Did I hit a new squat PR the next week? <laughs> No. So it was stressful. It made me sore. It was novel, but it didn't make me stronger. And it didn't make me stronger because it probably wasn't specific enough. Right. So, so we can really take novelty out of this and say, well, like, look, anytime we use something new, there's going to be a couple of weeks that the novelty of the exercise is the thing that's providing the stress. And once we start to get used to that, the novelty of that exercise, and it's no longer novel, then we look at increasing stress in a way that the normal ones, that a normal lift wouldn't do. And these are really our three options that we're left with. We can increase the range of motion. We can increase the intensity or the load, which will typically decrease, decrease the range of motion. Uh, or maybe it's using something like a slingshot bench press, right? Which would be the same range of motion, but still you're able to have heavier weight in your hands because of the, the way that the slingshot itself deloads the weight on your chest. And then we could actually slow down the lift. And I specifically would like to focus on the tempo slow down rather than the dynamic method speed up because that's, this is still kind of theoretical. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work. We can talk about it some. But those are really the three major ways that we're going to increase stress via supplemental exercises. So that's big picture. Now, why do I ever do supplemental exercises in the first place? Well, ultimately, it's because I'm trying to attack a weak point. And I'm trying to make the main lifts stronger. Sometimes it's for injury rehab, right? Sometimes there's things I'm doing, like that's certainly, those are times we use those. But primarily, if I'm trying to make somebody stronger, I do that. And then some of it just is honestly, to be totally honest with you guys, some of it is just to sort of avoid boredom sometimes in the gym. You got to be really careful with that. That's a slippery slope, right? Because before too long, you're doing CrossFit and and insanity workouts just to keep things mixed up. Like we want to actually do the thing that's going to make the, give us the biggest bang for the buck for as long as possible. And that doesn't mean that we're super excited about like, we, or we don't even care that much about making sure that people are like, it's not about muscle confusion. But if you do this right, by the time somebody is a late intermediate or early advanced lifter, doing sets of five or even just doing sets of five and threes and ones or something along those lines on just the four main lifts starts to get pretty old. And there is some need for some freshness from a mental sort of stagnation standpoint. And so we'll increase or we'll, we will introduce supplemental exercises in order to continue to increase stress. Now, remember we talked about last week the right time to do that or one of the right times to do that in my opinion is if we're in a four-day split and we've got an intensity movement followed by a volume movement and those are still like the main lifts non-supplemental and we keep increasing the intensity on the intensity movement and we keep increasing the tonnage on the volume movement at some point we can't increase those anymore like we start to run out of like gosh i've done four sets of five and then five sets of five on volume and then six sets of five, we started talking about like 30 reps, 30 work reps is probably the top end of the spectrum of kind of what you can hit from a strength perspective, something that would actually carry over to strength. And then I'm hitting like the top set of five or a top set of three or a top single or top double and maybe a few back off sets. And at some point, what will happen is that initial stressor in that initial lift will have both intensity and volume components, right? You'll see this all the time. So almost everybody, even those of us who disagree with some of this big stuff, start to see stuff that looks like this. Squat, 
one by three at let's say 455 followed by three by five or i'll even say four by five let's say four by five at let's say 370 something like that now what's the primary stressor in this in this initial lift is it intensity or volume it's actually my first trick question of the entire class it's both we're still driving up intensity in the first in the first lift or in the first set work set but this in and of itself is not enough work if i just do the volume and i never do the intensity it's not specific enough to keep driving up the heavy weight so the goal here is this set continues to get heavier and heavier and heavier and these back off sets continue to get more and more tonnage and when I do that, I'm combining the intensity day and the volume day or the intensity lift and the volume lift into the same lift. And then that opens up a slot for like a supplemental deadlift. And now I have some options. So instead of doing intensity squat and volume deadlift, I'm doing both intensity and volume squat on the same day on the same movement first followed by a variation on the deadlift. On the other day, it'd, it'd be flip-flopped, right? You would do uh, intensity deadlift and some back-off sets of deadlift, some significant back-off sets of deadlift, and you could have a supplemental squat. And of course, the same thing on the bench press and the press. This is a great time to introduce that supplemental lift. Now, here's the question. If I'm going to introduce those supplemental lifts, let's talk about what those might be. All right. So I'm going to go in order for a second of what I can see you guys on my screen. So I'm going to put something on the spot. If you give me a weird answer, don't feel bad. What is a decent su supplemental squat? Any supplemental squat at all? All right. I'm going to summarize the answers for you. This is not an exhaustive list, but it should cover most of the variants that you'll run into. We've got box squats, pause squats, tempo squats, pen squats, We've got squats with a different bar position, so high bar squats or front squats. We've also got squats that are done with different bars, like a safety bar squat or a cambered bar squat, duffalo bar squat. Um, we've got banded or chain squats, so using bands to add tension to the squat or using chains to add extra resistance to the top of the movement. And we've got belt squats. Okay, those are all perfectly decent acceptable supplemental squat. So, and we can start going down the line, but remember that I'm going to constantly try to pick supplemental lifts that look a lot like the main lift, right? I want to keep the specificity piece as tight as I can. So are there reasons to do, and actually I would even argue like a belt squat. So this actually, let's, let's talk about this for a second. So belt squat, Zercher squats, the question is, are those squats supplemental squats or accessory squats? So let's be clear. I might be the only guy that talks about it this way. So I also don't want to be so arrogant that to be like, well, this is my invention on this, like the way we're going to word this, right? Some of this kind of came from the West Side guys and some of the stuff that I learned in the olden days. But the idea here is like the chances that the West Side powerlifting crew in the late 90s and early 2000s would do a max effort belt squat is zero. But those guys have been doing belt squats for years. But they would do them as an accessory movement after the main stuff, you know, after the main lift, and then at, maybe after a supplemental lift or after the, some speed work or whatever, then they would come in and they would do some accessory movements. So all of these other squats are going to look a lot like the main squat, and there's certainly nothing wrong with the belt squat. I'll even leave it in there. If we had to start to rank these from a specificity principle, which ones are the most specific? Tempo, box, pin, pause. Okay. What about a chain? Probably pretty specific, right? Bands probably depends on how much bands are on the bar. In the entire MED world of programming, most often, what is the one you're going to pick first? Most of the coaches answered tempo squats. And the reason was because the lift is the same as the main competition lift. It's just at a slower tempo. So we're not changing any other variables other than the speed of the lift. 
And a second reason to use it is it can be used to address form issues that may have cropped up, since the slower tempo allows the lifter to focus on a specific aspect of the lift. That's right. So often, often we'll do that Wednesday light day. Sometimes that Wednesday light day is this, is that tempo squat, right? And it's because often that tempo squat is, it fixes, it remediates a problem, right? What are other movements that we use in here that might fix a problem with a squat? Not a weak point, but a form error. One answer was box squats. The box squat can be used for fixing a number of technique issues, like if a lifter has knee slide and they need to learn to reach back further during the descent of the squat, the box can be a useful tool for that. It could also be a useful tool for teaching depth and a number of other form issues. That's right. Yeah, somebody who's too far forward in their knees and you want to get them back on their posterior chain a little bit more, a box squat works pretty well. Are there others that are good form fixers? Another coach answered pen squats, which can be used to help the lifter keep the bar level during the ascent of the squat. The pin squat often fixes asymmetries. So those first three are pretty good on fixing asymmetries, right? What does a pause squat fix primarily? So the pause squat can be used to help a lifter learn to stay tight at the bottom of the squat. If they're, let's say, dive bombing down to the bottom or just getting loose in some way when they hit the bottom of the squat. They're getting loose in the bottom. A tempo squat and a pause squat will often fix the same problem, which is why often I'll have somebody do a tempo pause squat. So they'll go down slow. They'll pause for one second or so. And I'll often let them fire back up. Now, if they fire back up and when they fire back up, they shift through their toes or they shift back to their heels, then I'll keep the tempo both on the way down and on the way up. This can work for any of those lifts, right? For, or for any lift. So we can just tempo the eccentric component, or we can tempo both. It'd be pretty rare that I would just tempo the concentric. I don't think I've ever done that. But if the problem is in the loss of control in the descent of a movement, then a tempo works really well. Then you got all other sorts of reasons to use this other stuff. Like, why do we use a high bar squat? We just did a video on this. Like, By the way, you can check that video out on the Barbell Logic YouTube It's called How to High Bar Squat. Really, what's the primary reason we use a high bar squat? Again, not a trick question. I just can't get into a low bar position. That's the primary reason we use a high bar. Are there other reasons to use it? Yeah, of course. Chains and bands are more of an advanced technique. We're trying to work the full strength curve, accommodating resistance, because we know people are stronger at the top than they are at the bottom. You can also do reverse versions of those, especially reverse, reverse band squats. A front squat, certainly we can use for the opposite reason that we use a box squat. If somebody's in the hips too much, if somebody has a hip injury, if somebody needs to keep their hips open and get more in their knees, certainly if somebody's an Olympic lifter, we're going to have a front squat. It's a perfectly acceptable movement, right? And then there are all sorts of fun things we can do with the, with the different bars, right? So I would also certainly argue something like a a buffalo bar, duffalo bar type bar is a, is a pretty specific squat. Like it's basically the same sort of squat we do anyway with a slightly bent bar. So it puts especially um, big guys and older guys in a, in a little more comfortable position. You got some tendonitis, medial epicondyle tendonitis, things like that. A buffalo bar works well. Same problems with the safety squat bar. Somebody can't get the bar on their back at all. Like they can't get their hands back there at all. A safety squat bar works great. The downside of safety squat bar is it's really heavy by itself. They usually start at 65 pounds. It depends on the, there's a few lighter ones out there. But a belt squat is going to work all the same muscles that a normal squat would work, uh, at least around the hips. It's not going to load the spine, but it's not really going to carry over very well from a specificity sort of principle, right? Can a belt squat get additional work, hypertrophy, accessory, things like that to help drive up your main squat? Like, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I would argue that a belt squat would be far better than doing like leg extensions and leg curls. Certainly for those sort of things. But I wouldn't exactly call that a supplemental exercise, right? Not that it couldn't be. If you have somebody with a back injury 
like a no shit back injury, like a bad back injury. And they can't load their spine, which is pretty rare, right? Like, again, we don't get people very often who can't load their spine at all. But if you do, or you have somebody that's post-op, that's a pretty good thing to use, right? So I'm still going to pull that out because it's not as specific. Okay. All right, so let's do the same thing for deadlift. So what are our primary deadlift supplement exercises? I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. Once again, I'm going to summarize here some of the answers given. We've got a straight leg deadlift, we've got RDLs, deficit deadlifts, rack pulls, cocaine deadlifts. And if you're not sure what that is, you can go check out the Barbell Logic YouTube channel. There's a video about them. It's called Can Deadlifts Fix Back Pain? Try this variation. Besides that, we've also got paused or halting deadlifts. A paused deadlift would be one that you pull to a given point. Usually it's just underneath the knee at the tibial tuberosity and then you pause for a period of time, and then you finish the pull all the way to the top. A halting deadlift would be pulling the bar from the floor up to that specified point, and then lowering it back down to the ground. And we also have any banded and chained versions of the deadlift, just like we do on the squat. And finally, we have different grip variations of the deadlift, like a snatch grip deadlift. So once again, this isn't an exhaustive list of all the deadlift variations, but these are some of the major ones that you might use in your training. So these are, these are all pretty good supplemental exercises for the deadlift. Now, same question I had for the squat. If I had to start to lay these out in a method that said, okay, which ones are the most specific that are probably going to carry over the best or that you're going to use most often, what do you think? The main answers were deficits, rack pulls, and pause deadlifts. But the actual lift that you choose is going to depend on the specific lifter at hand. Yeah, the problem is, is sometimes you don't actually know where the weak point, where the weakness is until you start to do some of this stuff. Right? Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get to the point there is that you're probably going to do things like deficit deadlifts and rack pulls and pause deadlifts. And if you have access to, to chains, I actually really like chains. I, like, I would use chains with almost everybody I have that's intermediate and beyond if they have access to it. Just most people don't have access to it. It's the same thing. Like I would use dumbbells for upper body lifts for accessory movements. Literally pretty much every workout if I had access to dumbbells for the accessory movements. I like a rolling dumbbell extension more than an LTE. I think it works better on the triceps and it doesn't beat your elbows up as much. But a lot of our people train from home. I mean, you think about from Barbologic Online Coaching, how many of our clients are actually training at their house? Like, well, it's over 50%. How many of those people have dumbbells? Not very many. Dumbbells are real expensive. So we can't use them that much, right? So it's the same thing with chains and bands. However, those are all, this, this pretty good, this gives you a pretty good idea across the board. So we're going to use deficit deadlifts because it's going to elongate the range of motion a little bit, increase the range of motion. A rack pull is going to decrease the range of motion, but increase the weight. For a normal lifter, let's say they, they deadlift 500 pounds. How much are they going to deficit deadlift? First question I'd ask is, how big of a deficit? Well, how big of a deficit do I want for a deficit deadlift? If I take somebody like, like I use Nikki Sims, she does deficit deadlifts all the time. Everybody knows she has these like super long legs. And I make her do a six inch deficit deadlift. So I artificially increase her leg length by six inches. How specific is that going to be to her actual deadlift? She deadlifts 425. What do you think she could do a deficit deadlift stand on a six inch box? I don't know. 300? I don't know. Never had her do it from a six inch box. So more often, I'm going to have her deficit deadlift from like one inch, two inches, one and a half inches to increase the range of motion a little bit. It's going to decrease the weight a little bit. It's going to increase the stress a little bit. And it's going to help her with her setup and position off the floor when we go back to her normal floor deadlifts. It's much harder for her to get set up correctly in a deficit deadlift than it is a normal deadlift off the floor. And so deficit deadlifts are hard for her and help her tremendously. If I go to a rack pull for her, she already has this high hip angle, 
right? So it's like the fulcrum's up high. Her her torso is actually really short. So she loads on 450 and she pulls a 450 pound rack pull. What does that tell you? It tells you that she probably doesn't need to be doing rack pulls because she's already good at them. It's not a weak point. Now, now it doesn't mean, I don't want you to get this in your head that like this is a guarantee based on this type of anthropometry, okay? But Santana, he is exactly the opposite of Nikki. He has really short femurs and a very long torso. He can do a one and a half inch deficit deadlift with basically the exact same weight he can do from a regular deadlift. Basically the same. Rack pulls absolutely kill him. So he's a 500 pound deadlifter. He does a 455 rack pull. 455 rack pull kills him. He's sore four days later from it. I don't know, man. Just, just is. So we find this weak point and we got to train this thing. And you, you start to notice that when he does his normal pulls off the floor, he's got this sticking point right where the rack pull is. He just has a really hard time breaking the weight off the pins on a rack pull. Good. That's what I was looking for. Guess what you're about to do, man? Lots of rack pulls from that position. Because I want to find the thing they suck at and make them good at it. And I want to do it while using specific exercises. Everybody notice that we didn't in the squat in the squat uh, list. We didn't put we didn't put overhead squats. We didn't do overhead squats, right? Why do we not do overhead squats? Not specific at all. Who can do an overhead squat? Olympic lifters, CrossFitters, people who actually train the overhead squat. That's a circus lift, right? It doesn't make you stronger. And if you can overhead squat 300 pounds, I promise you, you can back squat over 400 pounds. You're strong, right? But I, but I also promise you that there isn't a single guy in the world's strongest man who can do an overhead squat. None of them can do an overhead squat. Does that mean they're not strong? No, it's just a, it's a lift that does no specificity, specificity to general strength. So what I want to do when I pick supplemental exercises, I want to pick supplemental exercises that are specific to these big main lifts, the squat, the deadlift, the bench press, and the press. But then I also want to find lifts that are specific, but that the lifter also struggles with. They kind of suck at. And I want to work that because it's a weak point piece. And sometimes I don't know what that is until I test those things. The easiest thing that for me is, to, is when I first start to do supplemental lifts, I'll go about three weeks doing a lift that's a greater range of motion with less weight. And then after three weeks, I'll switch it to a lift that's a shorter range of motion with more weight. So on deadlift, like I'm going to start with a deficit deadlift for like three weeks for the supplemental lift. And after about three weeks of deficit deadlifts, we're going to do about three weeks of rack pulls. And we're going to see what are they good at and where do they suck. And I may have to play around during those first three weeks with like how much of a deficit or exactly what pinhole the pins are, the height of the pin on the rack pull. There's a point for me where it actually gets harder. I can rack pull with the weight, like the weight plates two inches off the ground. I can rack pull more there than I can with the weight plates four inches off the ground. For a big guy who's used to be able to set up tight, when I go down and get ready to set up for a deadlift off the floor, I'm so tight that my face turns purple. But when I get ready to do a rack pull from like just below the knee, there's no tightness. I'm like, oh my God, how do you get this thing started? You know, I can't, I don't like nothing stretched out. I don't feel like my hamstrings are very well stretched. My glutes definitely aren't very well stretched. My belly's not pushed up against my thighs like they would be in a normal lift, right? And skinny people don't know what that feels like. But for me, it feels like strength. <laughs> Right, I want to compress the spring, and the spring's not compressed, and so it's hard. So I have to learn how to do that. It's tough for me, right? I can, I can, a few weeks of deficit deadlifts, I can do a bunch on deficit deadlift. I'm kind of long-legged, short torso. Other way around is hard. After the initial choice of, okay, here's the first couple supplemental exercises I'm going to try, 
from that point forward, and because you're just trying to really kind of see where their weak points are and what they struggle with and how their body responds from an SRA standpoint, right? Like once they get through the kind of novelty piece of this after the first couple of weeks. After that, you should always have a reason for why you pick the supplemental exercises you pick. I'm picking this for this reason. It doesn't always work. It doesn't mean it always has to be right, but like we're not just going to do like CrossFit does in the hopper. We're like going to roll the thing and stick our hand in and pull like a thing out of a hat and go up. Oh, you're doing a, a halting deadlift today. You know, there's reasons for that, right? We always want to have a reason for why we choose what we choose. In the beginning, we don't always know. We're trying to find that spot. You might know based on, or what you think, you know, based on what, the, what their lift looks like off the floor. If they do a full range of motion deadlift, they struggle to break it off the floor in the right position. And you might go like, well, they're probably going to have trouble off the floor. So a deficit is probably going to be the thing that helps them. So certainly you can go in with some idea of what's going to be most helpful. But after the beginning, you'll start to accumulate data that will tell you what to pick. All right, so let's talk about the bench press. Bench press, supplemental lifts. All right, I'm going to run down the list of supplemental lifts that the coaches brought up. We have, in no particular order, the incline press, floor press, a paused bench, a hover bench, where you let the bar hover over the chest without touching, a tempo bench, slingshot bench. You've got different grip variations. You could do a close grip or a wide grip bench. You could use a bench press to the pins, a pin press. Uh, you can also use a block press to control the range of motion. And then we have some other variations like a dumbbell bench um, and then specialty bars, just like the squat. We talked about the safety squat bar. We could use an axle bar on the bench. And of course, we can also use bands or chains, just like the squat and the deadlift. All right. So that's, that's most of them for sure. Certainly there are a bunch that we can do. So same thing, right? So where do you start? Like where are good places to start? Well, we're going to go back to the exact same criteria that we use for everything else. So which ones are probably going to be, are going to carry over best because they're most specific to a regular bench press. Okay, so let's go down the list. What makes an incline specific? There's actually a very important piece to this. One answer was the degree of the incline is going to determine how specific the incline press is to a bench press. That's right. How or degree of incline. A low incline bench press is going to be more specific than a high incline bench press, which actually would be more specific to a press the higher the incline, right? So the degree of incline tells you how specific an incline bench press is to a normal bench press. Floor press. That's fairly specific, but not crazy uber specific, right? You're laying on a floor. There's no leg drive. It depends on how long the humerus is, how long the forearm is, how big the barrel chest is. That changes lots of things with the floor press. If you watch our floor press video, the guy I teach the floor press to has big barrel, a big barrel chest and T-Rex arms, and he does a floor press and he still touches his chest on the floor press. I was like, you're defeating the purpose of this, this lift. <laughs> this is supposed to reduce range of motion, right? Certainly pause bench, length of pause. So you can just do a normal pause, which would be like a one second pause somewhere in that ballpark. For powerlifting, you can do a two-second pause. You can do a three-second pause. So getting longer than that, you're probably going to lose specificity. Slingshot, we did a video on these, or at least on these kind of overloads at the top. The nice thing about a slingshot is, is like you can do a slingshot and you can do it at the end of your normal bench press. So just do your bench press workout, throw on your slingshot, start your slingshot work where your, last, where your bench press left off and just work up and hit a few more sets get a little bit more additional work and do a slingshot, right? It's very rare that I would program a slingshot by itself as like the movement where you start with the slingshot. And even if you did that, you wouldn't like, you wouldn't put the slingshot on and do the empty bar and 95 pounds or whatever with the regular slingshot. 
close grip bench press. What's the difference between this and normal bench press? Don't say the grip. I know the grip's closer. I get it. What else is different? The range of motion is longer because the arms are artificially made longer by the closer grip. Okay. What muscles get work more? The triceps. More closed angle at the elbow at the bottom with a close grip bench press. What about the wide grip bench press? Opposite. Triceps less. More pec. Wider angle with the humerus at the shoulder joint. Not only that, you can argue that the pecs are going to be used more in a wide grip bench press and that the close grip bench press, while definitely the triceps are going to get worked more, that I could argue that the front delts are also going to get worked more. The delts will uh, because the pecs aren't stretched quite as much there, right? You look at things like board presses, right, where you take a bench and you take the bench press bar and you lower it down to a board like a two by six on your chest or maybe two two by sixes on your chest or maybe three two by sixes on your chest. It just reduces the range of motion. You can do a lot more weight. You can treat this a lot often like you would a slingshot. It's top end work. Pin bench press is the same. What's the difference between the board, a board press and a pin bench press from a specificity standpoint? One coach said that you get some rebound off of the board that you don't get off the pins. So I would agree. I think there is some more rebound on a board press than on a pin bench press. But I also think that even if you don't have any rebound, I think that a board press is still going to be slightly more specific than a pin bench press. I mean, you're, you're, you're all around it. The idea there is, where does the bar touch on a normal bench press? It's going to touch your chest. Where does it touch on a board press? Well, kind of your chest, right? Because your board is your chest. But but the weight is actually distributed on a pin bench press into the pins, not into your chest at all. So while the range of motion might be identical, the way the weight is distributed at the bottom is different. Certainly bands and chains, same thing we did with the other lifts. Certainly specialty bars. I will often use specialty bars when there are injuries to deal with. Football bar, let them take a neutral grip. They've got some sort of issue where they need to take a neutral grip. An axle seems to take some pressure off of problematic wrists and forearms and bicep tendon, bicep brachialis, that sort of area. Duffalo bar, cambered bench bar, that's going to that's gonna elongate the range of motion, right? going to be significantly harder to do and you got to be careful but it's real heavy if you're a big guy there's a better chance of tearing a pec doing that right it's a downside of dumbbells it's a downside of dumbbells across the board can't use as much weight up until micro gains it wasn't incrementally loadable right that's another problem like you've all you guys have all probably used this before and if you're really strong it's not that big of a deal but like even when you get really strong you don't. You start to see dumbbells not in five pound increments anymore. You see them in ten pound increments. So once you get to hundreds, you all, you never like it's really rare to see one hundred fives. You'll often see one tens, one twenties, one thirties, one forties, one fifties. So if you can bench press the one thirties for a set of eight, how much can you bench press the one forties for? Sometimes zero. So and then you can get those little like dumbbell hook things that hook onto a barbell and they help get it into position a little bit better. They're just hard to use. So dumbbells are probably better used as an accessory movement than they are a supplemental movement. They certainly can be used as a supplemental movement. I think if you can do them right and well and you've got good spotters and you're careful, you could actually, I think that dumbbells can make you really strong if you're already decently strong. What's hover bench do for us? Certainly a longer time under tension in that sort of loading period. Why would I use a hover bench to fix something? Like what would I be fixing with a hover bench? The hover bench can be used to help the lifter stay tight at the bottom of the lift. So one example would be if you see the lifter bouncing the bar off their chest, you could use the hover variation to help them stay tight and not rebound off of their chest. That's right. A bounce off the chest. A hover bench will often fix that, right? A pause does too, right? A pause can fix that too. And then sometimes just the cue of, again, like touch your shirt, but not your chest or whatever. And tempo fixes that thing too. 
lower really, really slow. I use tempo more often than not, not when they lose control, but when they can't control their elbows. Elbow angle, they over abduct or internally rotate. So if they internally rotate early, coming off, right? So uh, a tempo will usually help control the elbows there. A uh, slingshot actually works pretty good for that too because it kind of forces you to tuck your elbows. A duffalo bar will help with that. It'll force you to tuck your elbows, all those sort of things. I say tuck your elbows. You know, that's not a real kinesiology term, but everybody knows what it means. So, okay, here's the hard one. Press supplemental exercises. What are the ones we know we can use? What's the primary one we use? So the primary one is the pen press or the press lockout. We've also got strict presses, so done without any hip movement or rebound. We've got seated presses. You can do those with or without back support. Dumbbell presses, of course, and some other ones named where paused presses and press starts. And then, yeah, then you start to get into this other thing. Let's talk a little bit about push press. What about push jerk? Some of those things. Uh, press starts actually works surprisingly well. So I think press starts is something that everybody should. That's a, that's a, that's a sneaky Reynolds trick you guys should use. If you ever have somebody, when you have them going into a, into a strength lifting meet, they should be doing press starts the last three weeks before the strength lifting meet. Overload, throw, two singles, three singles max. Don't overdo it. They'll get tendonitis in their elbow. And, but get them used to handling more weight in their hands than they're used to pressing. It works really, really well. Usually on week three, they had a PR accidentally. They accidentally PR their press start is what happens. Put on like 5 to 5% more than they can actually press, and then they accidentally press it. And they're like, whoa, I, I had a PR. Z press is like a floor press, but for a, uh, an overhead press, it's a seated floor press off of the pins. So all of these are, are options that can potentially work. What you'll notice is that there's a lot less that we tend to pull from here, right? Now, I'm going to make an argument against the push press and the push jerk. Does a push press and a push jerk use more muscle mass or less muscle mass than the other stuff that's on here? It uses more muscle mass. Therefore, it fulfills the most muscle mass criteria better than the other ones do. But it's shittier. Why? One coach pointed out that the press is intended to be an upper body lift, so you don't actually want to use a bunch of lower body musculature if the goal is to stress the upper body. Yeah, could it be that the criteria should actually be we want to use exercises or choose exercises that use the most muscle mass for the muscles we're actually trying to train? I want to train the most muscle mass. How much stronger do our quads get from a push press or a push jerk? I would say zero. Now, certainly, you take the, again, the sedentary person off the street, they'll get stronger. Their quads are going to get stronger. But that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about taking Cody Anino or Nick Maggio, and they're going to do push press or push jerks, and their quads aren't going to get any stronger. And you know what else isn't going to get any stronger? Their shoulders aren't going to get any stronger. Because our shoulders aren't going to do any work on a push press and a push jerk. On a push press, what's getting trained on a push press primarily? The triceps are. And so I would argue against these, right? And I think everybody else would too if I were trying to make my press go up. Now, I do believe my press makes my push press and my push jerk go up. But I don't believe my push press and my push jerk make my press go up. This is not a two-way street. So one coach asked here if the same logic could apply to the press 2.0, where you're using a hip thrust to get rebound off of the hips and use that rebound to propel the bar upward. When I train people in the press, beginners, I teach everybody how to do what we would just call a strict press or a press 1.0 or whatever you want to call it. Like It's just strict. Because I've always said, I think the press 2.0 is an intermediate to advanced movement. There's nothing wrong with it. I actually think it's great. I think everybody, everybody should be able to press 2.0 more than they can strict press. So I'm not talking shit on it. I just think that it makes sense if what I'm trying to do is train 
the pressing muscles, let's train the pressing muscles and using our hips or quads or knees or whatever to throw the weight doesn't do that. There was a long discussion here, and one of the arguments for the press 2.0 is that the hip motion pulls the chin backwards and gets the head out of the way so that the bar can travel perfectly vertical over the midfoot line or the midline without having to go around the head. You want the barbell to stay over midfoot, and if it stays over midfoot, your head's in the way. You're going to hit yourself in the chin. You're going to hit yourself in the face. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think that much because you can just lean back a little bit and look up and you're out of the way, right? And the problem that I was seeing when we taught people who didn't know how to do it, the hip movement is the hips didn't, you know, when the hips go forward, the shoulders should come down. But what you would often see is people, their hips didn't go forward hardly at all and their back would go back and forth. Well, for yeah. equal, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So they're holding on to that bar and it's coming back and then forth and that's throwing the bar forward. And I was seeing this as a primary problem in seminar all the time. Again, if you, if you guys watch Cody's presses like on his Instagram, he's got this perfect. His hips go way forward. That bar comes way down and way back up. That's the point. So the, the, the equal and opposite reaction is that the bar comes back up because he got it to go down. But his hips went forward to do it. So... Yeah, I think that in general, you would do better training the press by, by making the press strict. Yep. And then I think there are ways to then increase stress. If the goal for a supplemental movement is to increase the stress, you guys ever done, that's why you ever done like pin presses or press lockouts that are big range of motions. Dude, those are hard. You do a pin press and you put the, and you put the pins at your mouth at your chin, at your nose, and you're just, and again, you're kind of out there in no man's land with no tightness to throw against, and you got to just strict press the thing from the bottom, bottoms up, press off the pins. Those are hard. A strict military press is hard. A seated press with no back support is real hard. Unless you're Nikki Berman, then she does more than, ever, than she does standing. We can't even figure that out yet. So, but you know, like that stuff is, hard. so I'm actually trying to increase stress. Remember, we got to come back to, why are we picking these things? What tempo squat, everybody tempo squats less than the normal squat. That's the point. It's slow. It's hard. It's more stress, but not as hard on your joints because it's slow. A box squat is often, if done correctly, a box squat should actually be harder than a normal squat unless you do it West side style and you sit on it and rock backwards and rock forward and use the momentum, but that's not doing it right. Now, a pin squat, sometimes people I've noticed that a pin squat, if you take that pin to parallel and not like way deeper than parallel, people often get better at a pin squat and they can often sometimes pin squat as much or more than they can regular squat, right? So the idea here is you're, you're trying to go through this list and you're saying, look, what is the primary driver of the stressor? And with supplemental movements, it's exactly the same question and answer that we had as we started to get into the minimum effective dose concepts. Some of these movements are shorter range of motions and higher amounts of weight, which means that my argument would be, and it's a theory, but the argument would be that the primary driver of stress in those movements will be intensity because you'll be able to lift more weight. And then some of these movements are going to be harder, longer range of motion, slower, no momentum. And the primary driver of stress for those movements will be volume. And you're like, but what if you don't do as much volume? You're looking at volume wrong. Volume is really about time under tension. How long did it take to complete the movements? Right? It's not work. Work's a little bit different. Right? Work is like how much weight I'm moving over how much range of motion. So theoretically, a tempo squat and a normal low bar back squat 405 for a single and 405 for a single is the same amount of work, right? Same weight, same range of motion, same amount of work. Not the same stress though, right? The tempo one's harder, more stress. So we're trying to pick exercises that help us drive the stress up. And they do that by attacking weak points and by either allowing us to use more weight 
so we can keep driving up that intensity quotient or more volume, more time under tension, greater range of motion. Greater range of motion is more work. Deficit deadlift is more work than a regular deadlift. Okay. There's your supplemental lifts. Are there more? Sure, there's more. But that's kind of the bulk of them. And what most of you will find is as you coach, I wouldn't call in, I think everything that's on this list, I think at this point are pretty solid are perfectly fine to use. What you'll find is as a coach, you'll find four or five maybe per lift that are sort of your go-tos that work pretty well with your clients and you'll put them on some sort of rotation. And you can do it where you can run them on one of these supplemental movements for like six weeks in a row and get them as strong as you can and then change the supplemental movement. You can rotate the supplemental movement every couple weeks. You could rotate the supplemental movement every week once they're used to them. And it's not, you don't have just novelty all the time. And you can utilize these supplemental movements in a way when you start programming them for sets and reps where you are, you are focused on either A, volume, or B, intensity. Or just like you do with most Western periodization, a lot of times you're going to do the longer range of motion movements for competitive lifters. You're going to do longer range of motion movements for higher volume further out from a meet. And as you get closer to a meet, you're going to do the, you're going to do the higher intensity, shorter range of motion stuff to get more weight in their hands. So like a press lockout is a great version for this. So way out from a meet, they're going to do a bigger range of motion with more volume on the pin press. And as they get closer and closer to the meet, that range of motion is going to get a little shorter. The weight's going to get a little heavier. The volume is going to go down because I want them to learn what 30 pounds more than their actual press feels like in their hands. Same thing with stuff like moving from deficit deadlifts to rack pulls. Same thing, moving from close grip bench press, long pauses, tempo bench presses, starting there and working your way towards slingshots, uh, board press, pin bench press, bands and chains, all those sorts of things, right? You're going to tend to start with the longer range of motion movements. Remember, we're talking about clients now. You guys have gone through this class, clients who are now in multi-week programs. Your clients are all doing like month-long-ish programs or potentially even longer. Therefore, you have an opportunity to start with the longer range of motion with less weight and move towards shorter range of motion with more weight. And that starts to look like a peak. And that's where we're going to start taking the class is now how do you actually peak their strength? We're going to talk about that next week. So we'll get into the peak. We'll get into block. We'll start to sniff on some DUP next week. And then we'll do some Q&A in the final week, answer other questions. I'm happy to talk through energy systems, bioenergetics, conditioning, like how you throw that, how you add conditioning stuff in. I'll definitely add that to the list. It's actually not as difficult as it sounds. It's pretty simple. And we'll talk through it. Okay. We'll talk to you guys next week. All right. That's a wrap on MED Masterclass number six. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something. I hope you now know how to incorporate supplemental lifts into your program. If you're enjoying this series, make sure you share it with a friend. Maybe you've got a training partner or some friends that need some help with programming and the series might help them. Go ahead and share it with them. Also, while you're at it, leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think. Make sure you leave us a five-star review. And of course, if you have any questions about this content, about MED or anything else training related, you can send questions to Matt and Scott at questions, that's questions with an S, at barbell-logic.com. All right, we'll talk to you again in a couple days. Fire.